All right. Red alert there. There we go. All right. This is my tech corner. Uh, I'm just going to very brief overview of the kind of stuff that I'm doing. I've got lots and lots of projects. Um, that's me. I'm AMC on Slack. And if you want the slides, you can go to that URL and download the PDF of these slides. All right. So what are the various things I'm trying to work on these days? So uh, plug-in coordination, we've talked about that at previous summits. Um, Zeyun was working on that, but he's bugged out. Um, so it's with Faye now. Hi, Faye. Thanks. You're the best. Um, it's not actually being worked on right at the moment. He has some other priorities. But this is something that keeps coming up again, and it was talked about in some of the earlier talks. This is primarily about having plugins be able to control the execution of other plugins, order them, make them go earlier or later, turn them on or off. Um, so, well, someday. Some of the, the phase one got in. Um, the next step is going to be getting the API in, so we're going to try to work on that. Um, working with the layer seven group here, Aaron talked about this. John's talk was about this kind of thing, too. I think Sudhir is talking about that. Uh, we're going to have a big discussion on Thursday about that. We got the IP allow YAML conversion done. Um, so for ATS9, you can do the IP allow in YAML. Um, there's still some discussion about um, whether we should have the old version in there or not. Currently, it's set up so if you have the old style IP YAML.config, it still works. Um, there's a bug there with the PR out on that, um, so I have to decide what to do about that at some point. I know the Comcast guys wanted to keep that in. Yeah, just get, yeah, there's a PR that'll fix that though. I thought Jeff wanted that. <laughs> yeah, it means you can switch back and forth more easily. Yeah, we should, we should probably get the PR committed and then um, decide if we're going to take it out entirely. So have been doing some work for the config inversion. I talked about this earlier. This is actually Leif's fault. So what we'd like to do here is rather than having a central place HTTP config that knows about all the different data, you have that data embedded in the subsystems, and then it provides converters to say, well, when the management data comes in, I will convert it to my own particular type. Uh, HP Connection Count has an example of this. Um, the thing that Aaron's been uh, dealing with is related to this. Um, it was working for the sharing thing, and then it got broken during one of the other HP Config updates. So that work's kind of proceeding. We actually have um, someone who will probably be working on it this month. So that's actually going to come back up. Working very heavily with HTTP Replay. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything more about this. Susan has a whole talk on this. Um, this is another tool for doing uh, sort of live testing, perform production testing, correctness testing, et cetera. Uh, another thing we just came up with um, last week for Jason, we all miss Jason, don't we? Because he's not here. Um, is verify plugin option for traffic server. What it would do is it would load the, the traffic server, it would load the plugin and then check the API to make sure that in fact at runtime would actually work. Right now if you have build pipelines, you can build a plugin. It's kind of difficult to tell if you got all the linkage correct. Um, so this is a way to do, have a mechanism to do that, to lose some verification before you actually put it in prod that it's going to actually come up and run. All right, what else we got? So I'm going to talk about some uh, other things to work on in a little more detail. So this has come up again, the JSON RPC. I'd really like to change the way Traffic Manager talks to Traffic Server to use a standard mechanism like JSON RPC as opposed to the hand-rolled stuff that we have now. Um, I think it would, it would just be much more powerful. You could then add things to it without having to change tricky core. And this is some of the ugliest code in Traffic Server, which is really saying a lot. 
Um, and people were talking about Envoy earlier, and see, so one and this whole, whole unified data plane. You see that kit? See that right there? It's in the slides. No, he's looking at the ceiling. <laughs> um, so, uh, whoops, wrong button. So, um, so this is one of the things that comes up with this ability to install and run without uh, local configuration. You were also talking about dynamic configuration for who? Who was that? The REST API? Uh, yeah, Judeer. So, I'd like, I mean, this would be really nice to just do in general to be able to have a traffic circle up and have a, a communication path you could talk to it and then configure it very dynamically at runtime. And I just don't see us doing that with the current RPC mechanism. This is something we might get to be able to work on inside Yahoo in the next six months or so, but if anyone else is looking for a really cool project, um, I would be happy to help you out with this design and other stuff. Um, let's see. So this came up with a discussion. I had a PR up. I need to close that PR up that was, was going to add the, uh, gosh, what was going to add? Oh, the TLS, uh, some TLS data to the milestones. You could get that. And it had a, a specific uh, our API call to get just that value. So Sudhir so and I talked about this quite a bit, and we decided that this is the kind of approach we want to take instead. We want to say, well, we have milestones for transactions, right? Well, we should just have them for sessions, too. So you have a, a session milestone interface. There's an enum with a list of milestones. You go in and you get them just like you get the transaction milestones. Um, so I think this is a much cleaner approach. I'll probably be working on this uh, this quarter and try to get that in. Um, so if anyone has any comments on this, um, go ahead and give them to me. But I'm going to be working on that. It ties in with a lot of the other session management stuff that we want to do. Um, what else we got? We also need to look at better session hooks. Again, this came up with other talks. We need to get serious about this. Um, Walt had some proposals for this. That was more for the CPP API, but we want to look at that. Look at that. This is the big thing right here, um, is that we have to look at inbound versus outbound. There are already a number of hooks for the inbound sessions, although a lot of those are TLS only, which can be a problem. Um, I know that uh, Case had some issues with this um, in terms of doing cleanup, where if you allocate certain things early on in the TSVCon hooks, you don't really have a good opportunity to guarantee they get cleaned up if the VCon goes away. So we really need a reliable close on that so you can really use those hooks. We need to have the outbound ones. Um, and my buddy Sudhir is gonna, gonna lead the discussion on this and make sure everything goes right. Thanks, Sudhir. You're the best. Uh, okay. So another thing that came up um, that I'm working on is um, looking at the C++ plugin API. Walt's been uh, fiddling with that quite a bit, trying to work it out. That really hasn't gone very well. Um, when I was working on transaction box, uh, I needed uh, C++ plugin API, but I took a very different approach from the one that's out there now, and then Walt ended up taking the same approach, which was bottom up more than top down. So the current one is really, I'm going to take over all your hooks and all your stuff, and I'm going to call you when it's appropriate. The approach that I ended up taking here, which I found much nicer, is it just provides wrappers for convenience. So I have wrappers for a transaction, a wrapper for a mine field, a wrapper for other things that can read each other. And then they do all the cleanup for me, right? So when my transaction object goes out of scope, it does any closing it needs for the, the cleanup. If my mine field object goes out of scope, it gets cleaned up correctly. Um, this is much nicer now than it was back when the Geffen did the original work because we have move semantics in C++11, so you can be much better about knowing that the thing isn't getting duplicated, not doing double freeze. That's, a, that's not a small difference. Um, so I've got piecemeal stuff here. I want to coordinate with Walt's work. Um, I do want to make some changes in the C API. I already did a couple of these to make it easier for C++, so that, for instance, we get rid of a lot of null termination things, so I can just say, um, give me the thing and tell me how big it is, um, or direct buffer transfers. So I can say, I've got this buffer. I'd like you to put the data in there. I don't want you to allocate stuff. I've got the memory I need. Um, so this is kind of on the margins, but being able to have a more regular um, API that you can build a uh, wrapper on top of. All right, wow, we're going through this quick. Any questions yet? Yes.
Yes. Yes. Yeah, at one time I had, for 5.3, I had a prototype that was doing production testing that never got uh, merged up. It wasn't quite ready, um, and things shifted a bit, and we ended up not using it. Um, Zeyuan was working on porting that back. Um, what he did was we needed to do, we ne you need to do a certain amount of tracking on the, the continuations that you created. So the object there was to first unify the hook dispatch. So you had one mechanism for dispatching all these hooks as opposed to a dozen of various scattered. So you could uniformly do this tracking, right? And we used the uh, thread local variable trick to, to provide that data. And then for each continuation, you can trace it back to a particular plugin, even through change of creation. And once you do that, then you, you can then control them based on the plugin that came from. So you can say, oh, I've got the continuation. It's on this hook. I can sort it based on the plugin that it was worth with. So we've gotten that in. The problem is that since I did the 5.3 work, we've gotten a lot more hook dispatch points. So the work that he did doesn't cover all the places. So the next step would be to make that consistent and thorough throughout the code. So we know that, that we can always tell where the th continuation originally came from. After that, yes, you'd need to do um, some sort of way of prioritizing. In practice, though, when I actually used this and uh, doing work on it was with the CARP stuff, because you want to do what someone asked is, I want to turn off plugins depending on whether I'm the ingress or the peer. So it ended up being more with just turning off plugins to say, OK, I'm the master plugin, and you and you don't get to run plugins don't get to run on this transaction. You're just, you're just done, right? And then you, you'd have a flip. If I'm ingress, I enable those and disable those and vice versa. Um, but yes, it was a consistent uh, complaint that would be nice to have an ordering constraint. Um, last time I talked about this, where were we? Was it, we were at LinkedIn? It's like a year, year and a half ago. Um, and I originally had a, prior, a, a priority system that you configure and plugin got config to give numeric priorities. But the pushback on that, those are very useful. You really want to just before and after stuff. Um, so I'd actually have to go back and look at my notes. You can bug me afterwards. Um, but I'd like to do this. I just can't get um, time to actually work on that. But Yeah, generally it's it's partial order requesting is what we normally say. I want to make sure that A runs before B. Yeah. So yeah, if anyone wants to help out with that, you know. So one of the reasons I want to talk about this is um, so if anyone has ideas or want to, wants to help out, uh, you know, talk to me. So um, another thing that came up um, for mitigation for one of our recent outages was uh, doing better on handling down servers. So I investigated the code, and I actually I was, I was kind of surprised at how it actually behaves. It does not throttle connections to upstreams that are marked down. It marks them down and then just lets the request go right on through. Yeah, you can go look at the code, seriously. Um, what it does do is it says, well, if I try to connect and it doesn't connect and it's down, then I'll reduce the number of retries. That's it. Um, so yeah, um, now in the find best HTTP stuff on the round robin records, it will tend to skip over down, down uh, upstreams. So you will get some of this effect if you have round robin records, but it's not very thorough. Um, so what I wanted to do here, this is a non-trivial change, so I want to go hit you guys with it. So what, what I would think the best thing to do is, if it's down, don't let upstream connections go to it. Right? You have a, you have a dead window, and you say, if it's in that window, well, just don't even try to connect. Just 503 immediately. 
Then after that time, you go into the zombie state where you said, well, maybe it's alive, maybe it's dead. And you want to you want to throttle the connections to the upstream here to say, well, I'm only going to let one or two through at a time, right? I'm going to re strongly reduce the rate. So I'm not pounding this thing while it's trying to come up. And then if you, in fact, do get a sexual connection, you clear it all, you say, hey, this thing's live, let's go, everybody's in. Does that seem like the kind of thing you'd want to do? So this is the current down server cache time, whatever that is, that's what sets this. So you say, okay, for that amount of time, nobody gets to connect. I'm just going to leave it alone. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to show these because I spent time on this trying to get it all right. This is the state diagram of actually how it would work. I sent an email out to the mailing list that has a link that you can go and click and see this diagram. Um, so I'm starting to work on this. Um, yeah, one thing we have to do is when we do the connect, we have to track whether it was a zombie or not so we know where to clear it. The big thing, yeah, uh, Brian brought this up in a later discussion, is that when we do the zombie connect, we do a uh, atomic compare and swap on the downtime. So exactly one uh, transactional win will update the downtime to, to shift the dead window forward to the current time. But he'll still go on through because he got the, got that everyone else who's trying to do it gets a 503 immediately. So this throttles the uh, upstream connections. Um, I got a sequence diagram, which shows how, how this works. You get the dead time, you go to the zombie state, it makes it dead again, and then it comes up and everybody's happy. Now this is a fun one. So this is a thing that comes up if your window, if your reconnect time is longer than your downtime. So you can get it down, you send a request, you do a zombie thing in here. And while you're still doing that one, yes. Well, what if they are all down? Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. If they're all, if in fact you've tried to connect to all of them and they've all failed, then they're all down. And do what with it? Flood it with requests that aren't going to get answered? Eh. Well, I mean, I would I would say that what you do is you if if all the servers are marked down, then you should just 503 until one of the servers' windows expires, and then you retry that server. Um, what happened in practice here, I got to be careful what I say, um, but it was a case when in fact all the servers were down and inaccessible and we were just pounding and, and uh, what happened was you, we accumulated a huge number of uh, zombie transactions that were trying to connect to this thing. I think we got up to 495,000 of these until traffic server fell over. So if we did leave one server up, we would have that exact same failure mode, and then we, we prevented us from, from recovering as fast as we could because we couldn't bring traffic server up because it'd accumulate all of these zombie connections. So from our point of view, to solve an actual production problem, we really want to say if they're all marked down, no connections, instantly short circuit, 503 of those guys, clear those transactions out, or just not coming up again. You mean if they all crash at the same time? Yeah, but I think if you're if you're saying that it's you want to hold off for five minutes, again, you also want to be careful about these servers can come up. We said other problems where yes, the traffic server comes up to fine, but the upstream because they're coming up and they suddenly get hit with you know five thousand requests, they crash again, right? So. I'm gonna honestly disagree here and say no. I think you, if you don't like that, you should adjust your downtime, right? If we allow the zombie leakers through here, right? So you can set your downtime and say 10 seconds. So what you say is, well, every 10 seconds then I'll let somebody through. And as soon as any of those connect, I clear the gates, right? So if that's a concern, I would just set your dead time 
to something much smaller, right? If you're letting these down servers get hit every five or 10 seconds, or another question, that's not, that's not gonna stop them from coming up, right? And you'll recover quicker, right? Right now, it really doesn't help to do that. Um, but those are actually good questions, thanks, yes. So I think we've seen uh, when, then when everything goes down that uh, serve while, or um, serving stale while error is not working or something on it. That, that's okay. possible too. All, these were all non-cacheable requests and the actual problem case we had, they were all non-cacheable. Oh, I suppose that's true. Oh, yeah. Instead of sending the 503, we could do the, the stale. Yeah. Or stale, we probably need a little line saying. All right. That's reasonable. Yeah. The key thing I want to do is I want to get that transaction out of traffic server so they don't, because that was what was killing us. It would just accumulate for. And if you have any cache, then just keep the cache. Yeah. Just, keep yeah. If I can serve it, then that's okay. They'll, they'll clear out. Maybe I looked at that. That's. I think that was just the general retries. Now I looked through the code and I tested it, and the behavior is that it doesn't even check on the route, the roll up to um, doing the initial connect. There's simply no code there, as far as I could tell. Oh, there was a PR at one point to fix that? Well, that's entirely possible. Um, I'd like to do a slightly more thorough solution, right? Because one of the things I really want to do here is, is do this throttling here. I think that's a big, that would be a big win. All right. You mean the, the thin crossing problem? Correct. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's, that's outside of the scope of this, but PR is welcome. Yeah, I'm not sure. My my solution is to say, well, that should be taken out of the state machine and making made Aaron's responsibility. Um, but one of the things I want to do with with that whole layer seven stuff and, and decoupling these complex systems is it makes it easier to do these calculations without doing really funky stuff in the state machine states, right? So from the state machine point of view, in an ideal world, it would simply give me a transaction. If that means, oh, I tried to get this transaction, but it was not writable, then I can do stuff inside the strategizer or other pieces and just not tell the state machine about it. Um, so, all right. So, yes, I'm trying to get back into the cache, honest and for true this time. Um, First thing I want to try to work on to get the cache tool working again. Um, it's currently broken um, because uh, we lost Persia. Oh, we missed Persia. Um, and it just hasn't been a lot of attention to it. Um, I need to get, I need to do some work. Persia is in a desperate hurry right before she left trying to get some stuff done. So there's a lot of um, code ported over from the core, which I don't like. I want to do a completely independent Im implementation because in the long run, I want to be able to backport some of this stuff. Um, the support libraries uh, are quite a bit changed. I need to do that. We need to move that. Um, one of the questions is whether I want to pull this out of ATS repo, put it in a separate repo, work on it until it works, and then backport it um, so that I can get PRs in more quickly. Um, in the past, I haven't had PRs to put into the cache have not usually gone through very quickly, even for traffic server PRs. So I'm um, considering that. Um, it, any comments on that at all? Or someone going to volunteer to review my cache tool PRs? Evan? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that, 
I'm still not sure about that. We'll see how that goes. Um, but that's what I want to get to first. So this came up, gosh, at the ATC summit, I think it did. Someone was hassling, some traffic server guy was hassling me. Um, that, you know, if we're going to update the YAML, cache config actually wouldn't be a bad one to update. It's not particularly complex. Um, it's got some real, real major hacks in it. The, the volume thing, let's be honest, that's a serious hack, right? Um, but if we did YAML, we could actually do something clean and more reasonable. Um, so this would, the first step would be to unify um, storage config and volume config. There's no good reason for those to be separate. The question is whether we should look at putting hosting config or cache config in there. Um, one thing we could do instead is we could just remove those entirely and provide a plug-in API. Um, we could incorporate them into this, um, the one we're going to do for storage and volume, or we should put those together because they basically do very similar things, right? They say, given some property of the transaction, set certain cache properties. So again, anyone has an idea? So this is, um, this is my first pass on it for the storage and volumes. So, you know, root key, as we agreed, you have cache. And then you say, under that, you say storage. And so then you say, okay, well, for this storage group or whatever, I have a list of volumes that I'm going to have in this storage. And then here's the storage that's going to be actually used in that. So this lets you split these devices among these volumes. For the Comcast thing, what you do is you would simply have one volume here, and then, oh, here's the spans on that volume. You'd have another volume, and then you have the spans on that volume. So that would make it easier for you guys to configure it the way you want, right? For us, we have a, we take a, all of our storage and split it among the same volumes. And again, that would be easy for us. We just list our volumes here, we put the spans here, and we're off to the races. Um, this would actually not be um, particularly complex to do. Does any comments on this? Should I go ahead and do this? Okay. Decisive. <laughs> well, well, that comes back to I could easily do this in a way that would um, let you use either. Well, then make the other ones do it too. You don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. All right, well, we can put it off till 10. I mean, it's, um... I'm not sure. Why not? Oh, parent.config. Okay. Yeah, you said volume.config. Very close, yes. But then you've already said you're going to have cases where um, both configs are operable. Well, but in this case, there's no point of doing that. Ease of transition. Yeah, true that. Well, you talk to the ops guys. Mm. 
All right. Yes, exactly like that. All right, well, I'll, this will probably get done later then because then there's no, um, this is not going into 10 anyway, until 10 anyway. What? what? No, no, I just, uh, I just wanted to sketch this out. Uh, the code actually wouldn't take very long to write. It, this stuff is, this is not one of the complex configs here. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to, I just wanted to, to, you know, I don't want to write this and then find out that everyone thinks my config sucks. That's really not very pleasant. Your sucks. All right. Well, except for Leif. Well, this will take, this will remove volume config and storage config, and we just have this one config here. Well, that's that's more debatable, right? Well, we've been saying that for two years now. <laughs> host, I mean, ho uh, parent, we had no choice to do what we were doing to get progress. We had to do something. This one, no one almost ever touches. It, this is a low-hanging fruit of all the configs that we do, I mean. Right, but it's not that much work to do either. I mean, at some point, we have to just start doing them. So do it on master, and then we do it for 10. Do what? Land this on master, and we, we get it in for 10. All right. And then part of this PR, rip out the old shit, and just do the new stuff. All right. And then update the documentation that I painfully put into the docs site. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so actually something I am having hopefully get uh, someone work on this quarter is to look at disabling the RAM cache per volume. I know there's been lots of discussions about disabling RAM cache. Is this sufficiently granular? If you can say for this volume, this cache volume, turn off the RAM cache. Um, Evan. I, yeah, I think it's it's. It, yeah, well. Um, Well, that's what I'm asking. What else would you tie it to? Well, actually, no, I think that's actually very likely because what people are doing now a lot is they're using the volumes to distinguish different types of storage. Right, so this volume is SSD, and that volume is rotational, and that volume is a RAM disk. So when I turn it off, I want to turn it off for the um, the SSD and the RAM, but not for this rotational. No, no, it's way too late by then. That would be, I'm not confident I could implement that. I mean, because that data structure is attached to the stripe. So in this case, it's really easy. I go, I say, okay, well, I'm going to go to the volume. I'm going to find all its stripes, and I'm going to disable the RAM cache in the stripes. I'll just set the, some pointer to null, and you're done. Actually, no, maybe Jan's right. Golly, that feels so strange to say. <laughs> No, I mean, rather than turning off the RAM cache, you can prevent promotion to the RAM cache per remap, which is not the same thing, but might achieve a similar purpose, right? So when the, the stripe comes up, it, it's got to have a RAM cache or it's got to not have a RAM cache. You can't decide that later. 
but you could control whether something was promoted to the RAM cache or not. Yeah, I think I'd still want to do this, though. I think there's, there, there are reasonable uses. This is, doesn't, isn't going to be very challenging. I think there's real use cases to say, this volume for this storage cluster, I do not want a RAM cache. Just turn it off. All right. But yeah, bug me about that later, Jan. Um, yes, I am getting back to partial object caching. We actually might have some staff support. Um, and there's a couple other people. I know that the, somebody at LinkedIn was bugging me about this. Um, and I know the Comcast guys would like this too. Um, I need to go back and review the design. This is this is another thing that was um, getting close to prod testing. I actually put it in prod a few times, and then it fell over, unfortunately. Um, but I have a design to, to fix those things. I need to go back up. The big thing I need to do is the thing that HRP suggested, which I've got to break this up into a smaller piece of work. It was just way too big. I understand that. Um, and so I need to look at doing, you know, particularly like maybe bring some of the data structures in first and then doing some of the contention queuing. Um, when we looked at the, Walt suggested about the, the queues for the mutexes, they don't make sense for the other ones and we said we had the data, but the one place that you, we did have real contention on the locks where queuing would make sense was in the cache, the stripe locks in particular. Those got hot. Right, I think there are other things too like Maybe not just looking at chunks, but functionality. Like like we always had issues with range requests. Yeah. How, so how can we make things like range requests better? How can, a, we, how can we do the thundering herd issues better? Well, like the avoid lock, herd, locking on certain objects, yeah. that sort of stuff. The contention queuing is a start toward doing the thundering herd. Yeah, I could also piece out the um, the range parsing because I did a much better in that. So, for instance, there's a version where it couldn't store ranges, but it could handle multi-range requests cleanly without breaking. Right. Anyway, so yeah, so looking at getting back, oh, that's the end. All right. Um, so that's kind of the stuff I'm going to work on for the next half year or so, except for transaction box, um, which I have a separate talk on. Um, so that, that's kind of where, these are the things I'm working on. Any questions? Yes. Well, my goal for the cache tool is to make something like FSCK so that you can go and you can explore the cache. You can say, I want to I want to roll over this and see how many, um, you know, what my bucket size is, what my average chain length is in the cache, how many buckets are filled. Because, you know, the cache is really this huge um, hash map, right? I want to look at uh, various properties. I want to be able to go to these slots and look for, um, you know, what is actually cached there, show me the URLs that are in there. Yes, I've been talking, that's Akhet 888. Um, I've been talking to him, he went, that's one of the reasons I'm hoping for some support from the Comcast team. He's been talking to me about that. It mostly works, it has some issues. He wants me to do some fixes for him. Um, this, my, the cache tool, yeah, so that's in Python. Um, this cache tool is uh, C++, um, so I'm hoping it's a bit faster. Um, the other thing, I, another reason I want to do the C++ is I really, I want to, in the long run, port data structures from this back into the core. There's some really, really ugly and inefficient things that are done with the cache and the core, but I don't want to just go change those because, well, then everybody yells at me. Um, I want to play with them in the tool, validate that they work and that they're good, and then say, okay, well, now these things actually are correct. Let's bring them back. Um, I was hoping to be able to do things like resize your disk partitions. I'm sorry, your cache partitions. Say, well, I want to make the, you know, the content size bigger without destroying the entire cache, just part of it. So things like that. But if you want to think of a FSCK as the model that I'm looking at here. Did, did you see the range slicer? No, I haven't seen that yet. I think, uh, I think you want to take a look at that before putting any more time into partial object caching. It might be completely dead. Well, maybe. Um, I'm still hoping to solve things like the thundering herd problem, so. Hmm. Yeah, Evan's the expert. Evil cow. <laughs> oh, wait, that's not quite right, is it? Um, yeah, so again, yeah, I'm hoping that, um, it was on my slide here. Yeah, Evan. 
Um, no, I'd love to, to cooperate with you guys. Um, so yes, actually one last thing I want to say before I finish up here. Um, I have to train a new guy on the cash, so I was hoping to have maybe a cash week if anyone wanted to come out to Champagne and spend a few days with uh, me and the and the crew and talk about cash and partial object caching and Ocket's tool and the cash tool and all of that sometime like early mid November. Um, so you know, um, just let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to go ahead. I'm going to do it anyway because I have to do it for internal reasons. But if anyone else wants to show up, let me know. All right. Well, thank you.